Hello, and welcome to Region Locked. As a long-standing Japanese property, Dragon Ball's popularity cannot be overstated. From its origins as a serialization in Weekly Shonen Jump magazine, it immediately captured the attention of manga fans and served as inspiration for other vastly popular titles, such as Naruto and Bleach. Today, it stands behind One Piece as the second best-selling manga series of all time. Though, it's worth noting that One Piece creator Eiichiro Oda has cited Dragon Ball as a guiding influence over his work. That said, for all the success of a series currently sitting in the top 20 highest grossing media franchises with a revenue of over $20 billion, the truth is that it took several attempts for the series to gain a strong foothold outside of Japan. It wasn't until the mid-90s that anime and manga were considered marketable in the West, having previously been dismissed as a niche interest with a limited audience. In Japan, however, attitudes could not have been more different. The franchise was thriving almost a decade earlier, with spin-offs, merchandising, and of course, video games, most of which never reached western shores and most of which we'll be looking at in today's episode. Suffice to say, we have a lot of ground to cover. This video will contain spoilers for numerous sagas throughout the Dragon Ball manga, anime, and video games. Also, due to the nature of Dragon Ball's fight scenes, this video includes materials that strobe and flicker and may not be suitable for viewers with photosensitivity. But hey, before we get started, I'm Kaiser Neko of Team 4-Star, and if you like Dragon Ball, definitely check out Dragon Ball Z Abridged over on Team 4-Star. Yay! Now let's get started. We'll start this deep dive with the first game ever released for the franchise, Dragon Ball Dragon Dahikyo, a relatively standard overhead shoot 'em up It seems a foregone conclusion that Dragon Ball would sit most comfortably in the fighting genre, right? But back when Dragon Daihikyo hit the market in 1986, the manga had only been running for about two years, and Journey to the West remained a prominent influence on the series. It was only later, after the series had started to approach its Z-era content, that its fairy tale origins became swiftly overshadowed by the superheroic martial arts in later volumes. Instead, Dragon Daihikyo features Goku taking on waves of enemies while surfing the Flying Nimbus, aided by his power pole and Kamehameha technique. Make it to the end of the stage, and the game will reward you with a Dragon Ball. However, if you take too many hits, Goku will fall from Nimbus and it's game over. Granted, the game does include hidden bonus stages featuring Master Roshi sparring with Goku in a typical 2D fighter format, but make no mistake, this is no Street Fighter. Dragon Daihikyo is also notable as the only game in the franchise with no ties to Bandai. Instead, it was developed and published by Epic for their very own Super Cassette Vision, a follow-up home console to the Cassette Vision, which had held its own as the best-selling console in Japan for two years until Nintendo's Famicom came onto the scene. This would change with the next entry in the series, Shenra no Nazo, which was both produced and distributed by Bandai. Instead of negotiating the license to release the game for the North American market, Bandai made the decision to strip the game of all references to the source material, rename it Dragon Power, and tout it as a loose adaptation of Journey to the West instead. After making little impact on an unimpressed audience, Bandai retreated back to Japan for the release of Daima Fukatsu on the Famicom in 1988. Unlike its predecessors, Daima Fukatsu made a concerted effort to follow the manga, opening with the death of Krillin following the World Martial Arts Tournament featured in the King Piccolo Saga. It's also the first game in the franchise to introduce card battling as a primary mechanic. Combat is split into rounds and plays out like a modified game of war, but the player and their AI opponent choose a card from a randomly generated hand. Whoever holds the highest number wins that round, and the battle's outcome is illustrated to the player in a series of surprisingly detailed animated stills. Cards can perform many actions in combat and are split into types such as offensive-based kicks and punches, special attacks like the iconic rock-scissors-paper and kamehameha, or defensive cards that allow Goku to dodge incoming attacks. The overworld is represented by a route map reminiscent of a roll-and-move board game, with cards used as movement currency rather than dice. Once Goku reaches target destinations on the map, the game shifts into a traditional text-based adventure game, presenting options that the player must choose in correct order to progress the story. While Daimao Fukatsu may seem like an eclectic direction for the franchise to take, it certainly captured the attention of the Japanese audience, with 1.25 million copies sold. After hitting a winning formula, Dragon Ball 3 Gokuden released the following year with the same gameplay structure as its predecessor, albeit with more dynamic animations and a brighter color palette befitting the franchise. Released in 1989, six months after the debut of Dragon Ball Z on Japanese screens, it was clear that retreading a single saga from the original Dragon Ball manga would not be enough. Instead, Gokuden spans the entirety of the events preceding the anime, 
albeit with a barrage of alterations made to the source material. Some were fairly minor, such as the option to choose Baby Gamera to travel the map instead of using the flying Nimbus. A more egregious example is the introduction of King Piccolo as his younger self from the offset, thereby omitting the summoning and subsequent death of Shenron, the wish-granting dragon. Nevertheless, Gokuden closely follows Goku's adventure all the way up to his epic battle with Piccolo Jr. in the World Martial Arts Tournament Finals. Retelling the Goku saga from start to finish in a single title created cohesion to the series, cementing the card battling system as a mainstay mechanic. With Dragon Ball now in the rear view mirror, Bandai were able to look ahead and capitalize on the burgeoning popularity of Dragon Ball Z with Kyoshu Saiyajin in 1990, the second installment to what would become the Gokuden game series. Broadly speaking, the game is an adaptation of the show's first season, culminating in the battle against Great 8 Vegeta. However, Kyoshu Saiyajin is not without its own variations to the official continuity. By this time, the franchise already had three movies under its belt, but the first bearing the Dragon Ball Z moniker had only been released less than a year prior. Known as Dead Zone in the West, the movie is set in the interim between Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, but in Kyoshu Saiyajin, the events of the film kick into gear immediately after the battle with Raditz, with the introduction of Dead Zone's Garlic Jr. and his posse of loyal henchmen. In terms of gameplay, the card battling system remained, but the linear route system was scrapped in favor of a freely explorable, tile-based overhead map common to Japanese RPGs at the time. What's more, while Gokuten provided players with the brief opportunity to play as Krillin and Yamcha, Kyoshu Saiyajin makes the regular occurrence in service to Dragon Ball Z's numerous story arcs with the inclusion of seven playable characters over the course of the game. It also introduced a party system, lifting the restriction to exclusive one-on-one -on -one fights to include a whole team of heroes going up against powerful foes, a combat structure more befitting the series. Instead of being confined to single animations, combat plays out dynamically in front of the player, with cards serving the same functions as items in other RPG battle systems, for example, healing a party member or freezing an opponent for a turn. A limited edition gold cartridge of Kyoshu Saiyajin was available to purchase at release, a testament to just how quickly the franchise took off in just a couple of years. With Dragon Ball rapidly growing into a household name in Japan, it was inevitable that a direct sequel to Kyoshu Saiyajin would be right around the corner. Released in 1991, Dragon Ball Z 2 Gekishin Frieza closely follows the events of the Frieza saga. Gameplay remained consistent with previous titles, with little deviation from the card battling mechanics of its predecessor. Graphically, however, the game benefited from more intricately drawn sprites and smoother animations, particularly during combat sequences. At this point, the Dragon Ball Z anime series was rapidly catching up to the manga, necessitating filler material and extended action sequences to give Akira Toriyama the time to turn out new issues. As a result, subplots exclusive to the anime series were also included in Gekishin Frieza, such as the mirror spaceship crewed by children displaced by Frieza, as well as the widely reviled illusion of Namek created by shape-shifting aliens. Much like Kyoshu Saiyajin incorporated elements of Dead Zone, Gekishin Frieza also includes a brief glimpse at Kanasa, a planet featured in the TV special Bardock, the father of Goku. The game features some major divergences from the source material, however. First, the game includes each of Frieza's transformations in his fight against Goku. However, as far as both the anime and manga are concerned, Goku arrived late to the conflict, once Frieza had already reached his final form. Second, the game omits Goku's own transformation into Super Saiyan for the first time, a huge moment for the character and the series as a whole. We can't put too much blame on the game's development team, however. The concept of Super Saiyan had only been included in the manga a mere four months prior to the game's release. Once the Frieza saga had wrapped up on paper and on screen, there was a clear need to return to the series as a whole with a renewed faithfulness to the source material, stripping back the movie tie-ins and unneeded filler. Super Saiyajin Densetsu, or Legend of the Super Saiyan, was released in 1992, a remake of both Kyoshu Saiyajin and Gekishin Frieza, bridging the Saiyan and Frieza arcs in a single title. Its release on the Super Famicom created the potential for a great leap forward in quality, and Super Saiyajin Densetsu delivers with fantastically detailed sprites and environments immediately recognizable from the anime. Combat became more dynamic than ever, with characters flying towards the screen and key powers blasting enemies out of the sky. The card battling system was overhauled to incorporate individual character values such as power level, attack speed, and key points. Outside of combat, the game dispenses with using cards as movement currency altogether, allowing characters to move freely, albeit still subject to random encounters typical of most RPGs on the Super Famicom at the time. To satisfy the need for commonly recurring enemies, the game relies on endless waves of recolored Cybermen, Frieza's henchmen, and even members of the Ginyu Force. 
Also in line with other RPGs for the time is the inclusion of rest stops and item shops. By interacting with fortune teller Baba or a Namekian salesman, the player may sell or purchase item cards for Zenny, Dragon Ball's in-universe currency, which can be used to restore health and key, or provide a temporary boost to characters in combat. As its title suggests, Super Saiyajin Dentatsu does include Goku's iconic transformation to Super Saiyan, remaining so faithful to the source material that the player must sacrifice one of their party members before the option becomes available. However, while the anime and manga specifically present Krillin's death as its catalyst for Goku's transformation, the player is free to spare him for the sake of another if they prefer. While it never left Japan, Super Saiyajin Dentatsu remains well-loved by many Dragon Ball Z fans who embraced the emergence of SNES emulation in the mid-90s, and its gameplay was compelling enough to spark translation projects for added accessibility. But hold up, because Bandai wasn't quite finished with the game series they'd already started on the Famicom. The sequel to Kekishin Frieza, Dragon Ball Z 3, Ressen Jinzo Ningen, was released in 1992, seven months after Supa Saiyajin Densetsu. Rather than jumping straight into the events of the Android Saga, the game includes a recap sequence of Frieza's defeat. This not only brought newcomers up to speed, but doubled as an opportunity to rectify the glaring omission of Goku's Super Saiyan transformation at the end of Kekishin Frieza. Like Kyoshu Saiyajin before it, the Senjin Zoningen ties in elements of the latest movie released during its development, in this case, Cooler's Revenge. The game recounts the arrival of the eponymous brother of Frieza and his men, though the conflict is quickly resolved in favor of focusing on Cell, the primary antagonist of the Android Saga. To pick up the pace, battle sequences for random encounters were set to auto-resolve once the level of the party surpasses that of the enemies in that area, doing away with the lengthier action sequences that, while well-designed, became long-winded and tedious after hours of gameplay. Instead, those more intricate animated sequences were left to shine during major battles. Overall, though, Resen Jinzo Ningen kept the established format of the Gokuten series, and any changes to the card battling system were minor tweaks to streamline it and aid accessibility. Resen Jinzo Ningen wasn't the only game released in 1992, however. The year also saw the release of Dragon Ball Z Gekuto Tenkaichi Budokai, the very first game in the franchise to implement traditional 2D fighting mechanics. Sporting typical controls of the time, the game offered a variety of modes, ranging from one-on-one -on -one battles to knockout tournaments featuring up to eight characters. However, not content with being just like any other fighting game, Kikuto Tenkaichi Budokai came packaged with a detached joint ROM system, a barcode reader developed and released by Bandai. Rather than select a character from an in-game roster, the player is prompted to scan in one of the many characters' cards provided with the hardware itself. While the game only supported 28 playable characters, the player was also provided with an additional 12 cards, which served as stat variants to switch things up. Of course, the system proved particularly troublesome for anyone unfortunate enough to lose the deck, or the reader for that matter. Despite its official endorsement by Nintendo, the Detach never really came close to becoming a staple feature of the Famicom, with only six further games released to support it before it fell out of favor entirely. The record-breaking success of Street Fighter II catapulted the fighting genre into the limelight in the early 90s. After its console port proved a hit with audiences hungry for high-caliber fighting games beyond the arcade, Bandai released Dragon Ball Z Super Patoden in 1993. Unlike Kikito Tenkaichi Brokai, which consisted entirely of characters duking it out with no overarching plot, Super Patoden followed Street Fighter's lead and included a narrative of its own. Once again, adapted from the anime, of course. While it remains primarily focused on the Android saga, the game covers an impressive amount of material from Dragon Ball Z, including the battle between Piccolo and Goku at the World Martial Arts Tournament, as well as the conflicts against Vegeta and Frieza in earlier sagas. Beyond the story mode, Super Batoden also features versus and tournament modes, the latter supporting up to eight players. It goes without saying that the Detach was left behind in favor of an easily accessible in-game roster. While many of these features are part of the course for any title building off the back of Street Fighter's success, Dragon Ball's unique aspects demanded a degree of innovation unto itself. For example, as the characters could fly through the air, each stage comes equipped with a radar map displaying where the fighters are in relation to one another. Once fighters are too far away to accommodate a single screen, the stage display shifts seamlessly into an actually dynamic roaming split screen, which moves from horizontal to vertical depending on the player's position, and occasionally dilates to feature fighters executing special moves. At this point, Dragon Ball was on an upward trajectory in Japan, and Shonen Jump was well on its way of hitting its peak circulation of 6.5 million copies. And to say that Super Patoden did well is an understatement. It sold 1.45 million copies in Japan, and remains the best-selling video game in the franchise to date at the time of this video. 
With such a runaway success on their hands, Bandai made the decision to finally step outside of Japan with a bona fide licensed Dragon Ball title releasing Super Potoden in France and Spain just eight months later. At this point, Dragon Ball was so established in Japan that it could shift units on its name alone, as Bandai would go on to prove with Dragon Ball Z Gaiden, Saiyajin Zetsumetsu Keikaku. The last Dragon Ball title released for the Famicom, it's also notable for being the first game in the franchise to feature an original story. Saijin Zetsumetsu Keikaku introduces antagonist Dr. Laichi, a brilliant tuffle scientist hell-bent on exacting revenge upon the Saiyans after the annihilation of his race at their hands. After releasing a toxic gas capable of destroying all life on Earth, it's up to the Z Fighters to put a stop to his scheme. Saiyajin Zetsumetsu Keikaku follows the Gokuden card battling formula, the last game in the series to do so barring the remake of Dragon Ball 3 Gokuden, released on the Wonderswan Color in 2003 and simply titled Dragon Ball. Zetsumetsu Keikaku was adapted into a two-part official video animation that functioned as a visual walkthrough for players released a year later on VHS. By effectively demonstrating the correct sequences of events to see the narrative to its conclusion, it also provided players with a guide to optimally complete the game. The footage was later repurposed for the only two Dragon Ball Z titles released on Bandai's multimedia entertainment system, Playdia. These two FMV games, Chikyuhen and Uchuhen, remained near identical to the animation but incorporated player choice at specific moments. For example, when Goku plays rock, scissors, paper with Korin. Incredibly, this OVA was remade in its entirety, its hour-long runtime halved, and came bundled with the widely released Dragon Ball Raging Blast 2 in 2010, the closest it's come to an official global release 16 years after its debut in Japan. With the Gokuten series more or less put to bed, and fighting games having finally found a solid footing on home consoles, it's no surprise that Bandai quickly turned its attention to chasing Butoden's success. Dragon Ball's popularity had picked up traction in Europe after the release of the anime's French dub, and while notorious for its questionable changes, it was the first dub available for the series, serving as the foundation for many of the European dubs that would follow. It would also inform the release of the third entry in the Butoden series, Buyu Retsuden. After the Super Famicom's runaway success in Japan, most licensed games were released on the platform in an effort to maximize sales. However, this was not the case in Europe, where Sega had decidedly edged out Nintendo. In order to capitalize on Dragon Ball's growing global audience, Buyu Retsuden released on the Mega Drive instead. With the reasoning that most European fans of the time were more likely to be introduced to the franchise via the dub, the game was released in France and Spain with an exclusive French translation and revised title, La Pâte du Destin. It was also sold in Portugal, but bizarrely, distributor Ecofilms chose to repackage the Japanese version of the game rather than the existing European product, and sidestepped the minor wrinkle that Japanese cartridges were incompatible with European hardware by releasing it with a region converter cartridge. After a superficial re-release that swapped out the typical Mega Drive blue box cover art for one of the Dragon Ball Z VHS cassette covers, the game saw a third and final release in Portugal that did away with the converter altogether by including the localized French cartridge instead. Nowadays, those Portuguese variations are fairly rare commodities and of some value to collectors, with open auctions sitting at a respectable $99.99. While Buyu Retsuden bears a near-identical resemblance to Super Potoden in how it looks and plays, it was not so much a direct sequel as it was a Mega Drive variant. Bandai refrained from bringing it fully under the Super Potoden umbrella, likely in an attempt to avoid alienating the existing fans of the game series on the Super Famicom. The official sequel, aptly titled Super Potoden 3, released on the Super Famicom as anticipated, rounding out the Super Potoden trilogy despite technically being the fourth in the format. Unlike its predecessors, Super Potoden 3 dispenses with the story mode, allowing the tournament mode to take center stage. The intention was to follow from Super Potoden 2's adaptation of the Cell Game Saga, however, the game released at the tail end of 1990. 94, slap bang in the middle of the subsequent Majin Buu saga's first airing in Japan, which rendered a faithful adaptation literally impossible. As a compromise, the roster of characters used in the Versus mode are based on those featured in the saga, such as Kid Trunks and Shin, as well as Majin Buu himself. Special attention was paid to honing the already kinetic gameplay, a major factor being the implementation of a quicker charge time for Ki, allowing more frequent uses of energy blasts and iconic special moves. Overall, however, Super Potoden 3 stuck to the tried-and-true formula that would make the series a mainstay favorite in Japan for years to come. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to hand this off to my good friend and business partner, Nick Lanny Patorlandis. Lanny, take it away. Thank you, Kaiser. I'm done warming up, so let's do it. The fighting game genre might have established itself as a sweet spot for Dragon Ball games by the mid-90s, but that didn't mean that developers were just going to churn out Street Fighter clones and call it a day. 
The franchise was still ripe for experimentation exemplified by Idainaru Son Goku Densetsu in 1994. Released shortly after the anime saw Goku's decision to sacrifice himself in order to protect the Earth from future threats, the game serves as a love letter to the character, charting his seven most iconic battles against the big names of the Dragon Ball Rogues Gallery. From his fight against Mercenary Tao as a young boy to his fateful final battle with Perfect Cell. What sets this 2D fighting game apart from the Butoden series is a unique system that doesn't actually allow the player full control of Goku. Instead, the combat is split into two phases. The first phase incorporates a tug-of-war system paired with a number of action modes the player can choose from allowing Goku to focus on charging up energy, dodging incoming attacks, or going on the offensive himself. No damage is actually dealt during this phase. Once one side clearly has the upper hand, combat shifts to the second phase where the superior fighter is tasked with combining Kana symbols to unleash a special attack that does impact their opponent's health. Intricately detailed animations play between battles that capture Dragon Ball's visual style so completely it appears almost indistinguishable from the anime. Through these cutscenes, the game implements the sentimental narrative framework of Goku's eldest son Gohan relaying these greatest hits to his kid brother Goten, who was born after their father's death and thus never got a chance to know him. Idainaru Son Goku Densetsu is a wholly idiosyncratic title, refusing to neatly fit into the predefined mold of what a fighting game should be. But these decisions pale in comparison to the decision to release the game exclusively for the PC Engine, more familiarly known as the TurboGrafx-16 to our North American viewers. The PC Engine preceded the Super Famicom and Mega Drive as the first console of the 16-bit era, though the more discerning retro fan will be quick to point out that this was achieved via a modified 8-bit CPU. It never made much of a splash in the West, largely due to poor marketing and the unintended stranglehold of Nintendo's exclusivity agreements. In the midst of the console war between the two powerhouses of Sega and Nintendo, it's no surprise that TurboGrafx-16 hardly got a look in. However, the console's manufacturer, NEC, was a long-established market leader in the personal computer business in Japan. This ensured a success that is oft overlooked due to the TurboGrafx-16's abject failure to crack Western markets. On the contrary, the PC Engine outpaced the Mega Drive in Japan and became a momentary credible threat to Nintendo's monolithic console. However, the decision to forego the Super Famicom did not help the game's standing and was the only Dragon Ball title in the PC Engine's Japan-centric library. The viability of selling Dragon Ball to a handheld audience was first established with the explosive popularity of the Game Boy, creating the opportunity to sell Dragon Ball to an audience of millions. Goku Hishoden released on the platform in 1994, though again exclusively in Japan, spanning from Goku's victory over Piccolo at the end of Dragon Ball and retreading the entirety of the Saiyan saga, Goku Hishoden is a turn-based RPG with unique combat features. Each opponent is allowed a certain number of actions per turn, and the player can choose to attack or move move around the grid map which displays the positions of each fighter. Each attack uses up the character's key energy and can be combined into powerful energy attacks ranging from key blasts to spirit bombs. Once the player's actions are exhausted, combat switches to the opposing fighter, with the player instead focusing on blocking or dodging their moves by completing a set of minigames. Despite these eclectic divergences from the typical turn-based gameplay at the time, Goku Hishoden garnered enough interest for a sequel, Goku Geki Toden. Goku Geki Toden was released less than a year later, following immediately on from its predecessor by adapting the Frieza saga in full and including a further four playable characters as a result, Gohan, Krillin, Vegeta, and Piccolo. It also brought Goku Hishoden's combat system into real time, complete with rolling illustrations of the fighters mid-battle as they would look in the anime. In 1995, the franchise would make a quick retreat back to the Super Famicom for the release of Super Goku Den, Totsugeki Hen. As an unofficial extension of the Goku Den series, the game returns to the franchise's earlier action RPG identity, albeit one that dispensed with card battling. Instead, combat is represented by an overview of Goku facing off with his opponent, each positioned at either end of a battlefield. Both fighters will gradually make their way towards each other, attacking once they reach a certain distance. Utilizing a rock-paper-scissors battle system, each move has a corresponding effectiveness against an enemy. As the player makes their way through the game, they gradually learn which techniques effectively counter others, as well as unlocking more moves to maximize success in battle. Outside of combat, Totsugeki Hen is dialogue-heavy, to a frankly astonishing degree. In fact, players will spend the majority of their time wading through lengthy conversations between characters more than anything else. Frequently, multiple choice questions interrupt the flow of dialogue, prompting the player to decide on how Goku should respond to a given scenario. 
In most cases, these questions serve to arbitrarily quiz the player on the events of the manga. That said, there are certain questions where answering differently can prompt the narrative to diverge from its canonical path, if temporarily. Despite being branded with the Dragon Ball Z prefix, the game's narrative is adapted from the events of the original Dragon Ball series, culminating in Goku's pivotal battle against King Piccolo. The release of Kakusei Hen, six months later, would go on to wrap up Dragon Ball with Goku's match against Piccolo at the World's Martial Arts Tournament, before transitioning into the events of Dragon Ball Z. Given the short development time between games, Kakusei Hen is a direct continuation of its predecessor with very few changes to gameplay and visual design. However, this follow-up more readily embraces the alternate narrative in the storyline, incorporating several bad endings such as the death of Piccolo at the hands of Kami, or Frieza stealing the Dragon Balls back and achieving immortality after all. The mid-90s also saw a reprisal of the Butoden game series, though it's impossible to discuss without first mentioning the release of Ultimate Battle 22, a 2D fighting game set on a 3D plane exclusive to the PlayStation 1. While the game hit Japanese store shelves in the summer of 95, Western fans were likely more familiar with its controversial release in North America in 2003, long after the console's obsolescence. Horribly dated as it was, with no accompanying English dub and gutted of all additional cutscenes, Ultimate Battle 22's cripplingly late debut in the States was written off as a quick cash grab by Atari. Its critically panned gameplay is paint by numbers in most respects but one, and it's a biggie. All the character sprites were designed by Toriyama's animation team, bringing the anime likeness to the gameplay itself. These sprites were recycled just four months later in Shinbu Toden on the Sega Saturn, which featured the exact same roster as a result. Not that it's to the game's detriment. In fact, Shinbu Toden was considered to be a vast improvement over its predecessor. The split screens so quintessential to the Butoden titles were rejected by Ultimate Battle. Instead, the camera dilates to accommodate its fighters, shrinking and distorting the sprites significantly. However, in Shinbu Toden, split screens returned, allowing players to zip across the stages at astonishing speed. It also includes a story mode spanning the Android and Cell game sagas, as well as a group battle mode involving teams of five characters going up against each other, with the winner decided by the number of victories overall. These features alone one-upped Ultimate Battle's bare-boned offerings, but they too are eclipsed by the absurd chaos of Mr. Satan mode, where players take the role of the mode's eponymous character who must bet on matches in order to pay off a rather substantial debt. To shake things up, Mr. Satan mode incorporates a cheat mechanic. The player can buy items such as banana peels and explosives to throw from the sidelines, disrupting the match and ensuring the outcome needed for a payout. Between matches, the player may also choose to gift items to a chosen fighter, boosting their stats to give them an edge. Whether the fighter accepts this gift is decided by a spinning wheel of fortune, as is any other action available to boost chances of success. The final entry of the Dragon Ball series on the Super Famicom came in the form of Hyper Dimension in 1996. While this too sits comfortably in the fighting genre, there is a notable divergence in gameplay away from the Street Fighter template. Instead, Hyper Dimension experiments with the fighting styles of SNK's hit franchise King of Fighters and Fatal Fury, encouraging aerial attacks and jump maneuvers and an increased emphasis on close-range fighting rather than the overabundance of key powers and long-range energy blasts seen in the Butoden series. To facilitate late-match comebacks, fighters are capable of regenerating health in a similar manner to the ability to power up key in Butoden, and if health falls too low, players gain access to a highly powerful desperation attack unique to their character to turn the tide back in their favor. In order to better accommodate a story mode in a fighting game format, the player does not just assume the role of one character fighting against many different combatants over the course of the narrative. Instead, each scenario is based on key moments of conflict from the Frieza, Cell, and Kid Buu sagas, while the player transitions easily from one character to another. For example, the player will take the role of Majin Buu to go up against Kid Buu despite having played as both Goku and Vegeta in order to take down Buu just a few battles earlier. The plot advances regardless of the player's success in battle, and defeat doesn't always hinder progression. If worse comes to worse, key characters such as Goku might require the player to use a sensu bean in order to revive them. As tightly orchestrated as the story mode appears, in practice it's not the most faithful adaptation. Critically, Goku is the one who beats Cell in Hyperdimension, which ignores the poignant sacrifice in Dragon Ball Z. What's more, the game's French version was released without the story mode altogether, likely due to the controversy stirred up around the level of violence in the anime at the time. It was eventually deemed unsuitable for young audiences and abruptly yanked from broadcast schedules in November 1996, leaving the Boo arc yet unresolved. French players of Hyperdimension had to make do with the verses and tournament modes, while the rest of the world had the full spread. 
That same year, Bandai embraced the distinctly polygonal future of the consoles, releasing Idainaru Dragon Ball Densetsu to the PlayStation and Sega Saturn in Japan. It also made store shelves in France, Spain, and Portugal as a Saturn exclusive. All European versions were translated solely into French, but bizarrely, the French version itself was sold under the original Japanese title, while the latter two countries saw the game renamed Dragon Ball Z The Legend. The gameplay has a distinct variation from all other fighting games in the franchise. Rather than the standard one-on-one -on -one skirmishes, battles in Idainaru Dragon Ball Densetsu consist of two teams of up to three fighters pitted against each other simultaneously. While it uses 2D sprites on a 3D plane in much the same way as Ultimate Battle 22, Idainaru Dragon Ball Densetsu utilizes the previously neglected foreground and background to create dynamic mid-battle cutscenes showcasing devastating key powers. The tug-of-war mechanic makes an unlikely comeback in the form of the power balance gauge, which swings in favor of the team that's gaining the upper hand. Once the gauge is fully filled, the active fighter on the winning team will perform a deadly meteor attack for a decisive victory. As far as the story mode goes, though, yet again we're going back to the early days of Dragon Ball Z, kicking off immediately with the arrival of Vegeta and Nappa. In fact, Idainaru Dragon Ball Densetsu is the first game in the franchise to incorporate all sagas from Dragon Ball Z, taking the player right through to the defeat of Majin Buu's evil form. With a whopping 35 playable characters and the opportunity to play multiple fighters per battle, the game allows players more freedom in shaping how key moments of the anime play out, as well as room to experiment with alternative matchups. It also rewards players who faithfully reenact the events of Dragon Ball Z in scenarios by granting them a Z rank, the highest available. Several fights can also play out differently to reflect the outcome in the anime. For example, Goku will turn Super Saiyan if the player allows Frieza to kill Krillin, and Android 16 won't fight in the match against the androids if Goku isn't chosen in the lineup, as he is specifically programmed to kill Goku and would refuse to fight anyone else at that point in the anime. By the turn of the millennium, Dragon Ball rose to its zenith of global prominence, and worldwide releases of games under the franchise's umbrella became the rule rather than the exception. Bandai settled comfortably into releasing titles on Sony consoles and Nintendo handhelds, a trend that has continued to the time of this video, though not without exceptions. In 2011, Dragon Ball Kai Ultimate Butoden made waves due to its exclusive release in Japan for the Nintendo DS. It was not only the first Butoden game released since GT Final Bout in 1997, but the first Dragon Ball title to go without an American release in 15 years. The Kai prefix refers to the remastered version of the anime released for the series' 20th anniversary in 2009. In fact, the series was in the process of airing its final few episodes at the time of Ultimate Butoden's release. Unsurprisingly, the game's story mode is a comprehensive adaptation spanning from the Saiyan Saga to the Kid Buu Saga just as Dragon Ball Z Kai does. It boasts a frankly enormous roster of 51 playable characters, though it's worth pointing out that many of these are alternate versions as the game does not allow for mid-battle transformations. Unlike its predecessors, Ki is generated automatically, removing the awkward few seconds required for players to charge manually, which had, in earlier titles, disrupted the flow of combat. Of course, no DS game is complete without incorporating touch controls, which the player can use to activate the more devastating attacks in their fighter's arsenal. Though this does more closely resemble the attack menu straight out of Pokémon than anything else. Nevertheless, Ultimate Butoden demonstrated the viability of a portable version of the Butoden series, a decision that Bandai fully embraced by the time of Extreme Butoden's worldwide release in 2015 for the Nintendo 3DS. Finally, we're wrapping things up with a slew of Japanese exclusives that go right back to the early card-based systems adopted by the Dragon Ball video games in the late 80s, filtered through a modern lens. Super Dragon Ball Heroes made itself at home in Japan's booming arcade scene in 2010, sporting a cabinet that would read physical cards to spawn various heroes and player avatars into the game. This was certainly not the first Dragon Ball product to grace Japan's omnipresent arcade scene. The first licensed cabinet released to the franchise was simply named Dragon Ball Z, a popular versus fighter you'd expect to find in a post-Street Fighter arcade landscape of 1993. Dragon Ball was also one of many properties appropriated for Bandai's dedicated trading card dispensing machines known as Cardas, which quickly rose to prominence from 1988 onwards. Over the course of a single decade, these machines dispensed 2 billion Dragon Ball cards, to the tune of approximately $370 million. These two big moneymakers collided in the mid-2000s with Bandai's Data Cardass machines, which integrated card-reading technology into classic arcade cabinets. Instead of picking fighters from a pre-existing roster, 
Players scan in the physical cards in their collection to play as specific characters. Dragon Ball's Data Cardass series performed exceptionally well, but didn't hit its stride until 2010 with its sixth incarnation, Dragon Ball Heroes. The game proved insanely popular upon release, claiming the title of number one digital card game in Japan for five consecutive years, with an average yearly gross of approximately $46 million. By 2013, a port was released in Japan on Nintendo 3DS, Dragon Ball Heroes Ultimate Mission. Featuring an enormous library of 200 characters spread across nearly 1,000 virtual cards, the game's developers made a concerted effort to recreate the interface and gameplay found in the arcade for a portable platform. By utilizing the 3DS's wireless support features, players could battle and trade with friends and even connect to the cabinets in the arcades. To keep up with the constant updates rolling out in the arcade version, it was followed by a further two 3DS titles, Ultimate Mission 2 and Ultimate Mission X, which endeavors to keep up with the ever-expanding story content and card sets that keep players flocking back to the arcade. By the time of Ultimate Mission X's release in 2017, the series had developed its own expanded universe via the introduction of mission packs and story arcs that arcade players could unlock and experience through various sets. While entirely separate from the official Dragon Ball canon, the in-game story proved so popular it was adapted into several manga volumes, as well as the promotional anime Super Dragon Ball Heroes in 2018. After the longtime clamoring of Western fans who were itching to get their hands on what was an unquestionably well-polished and addictive Dragon Ball card game, a worldwide port became available for Nintendo Switch and PC in April 2019 titled Super Dragon Ball Heroes World Mission, almost a decade after its original debut in the arcades. Looking ahead to the future of Dragon Ball, it's difficult to imagine little more than a smattering of region-locked exclusives on the horizon. After clawing its way out of obscurity in the 80s, the franchise is an undoubted global phenomenon, a mainstay of popular culture, and unquestionably profitable. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot's worldwide release in January 2020 was reported as a commercial success with 1.5 million copies sold in its first week. We hope you enjoyed this region lock deep dive into the fantastic series known as Dragon Ball. And if you're not Dragon Balled out by now, then feel free to head over to our channel, Team Four Star. We got a few Dragon Ball things over there. We have a full, complete playlist up to the Cell Saga of Dragon Ball Z Abridged. If you haven't seen that, you might want to give that a go. And uh, a little fan project we've been working on that we're calling Dragon Shorts that uh, kind of bridges the gap between the Cell Saga and the Boo Saga. And of course, we just celebrated db -sember, our yearly celebration of Dragon Ball. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.